Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Frame by Frame, a series dedicated to the craft of filmmaking. And few people know that craft better than Guillermo del Toro. From Pan's Labyrinth to Pacific Rim to the Hellboy franchise, he's brought the magic back to genre cinema. And his latest effort, Crimson Peak, is no exception. Now, I'm assuming you've already seen the advertisements for the film, but look at them again. What do you notice? Well, I'll tell you what I see. Color. Bright contrast in color. Kinda rare packaging for a horror film, huh? Well, it's no arbitrary choice. Nothing with Del Toro ever is. But this dynamic use of color is actually an homage to another legendary director. But do you know who? Well, I'll give you a hint. He was nicknamed the Master of the Macabre, and his films influenced Crimson Peak in three major ways. Which I could tell you right now, but where's the mystery in that? So lock the doors and grab your rosaries, kiddos. I'm going to tell you the story of the godfather of Italian horror and how his style haunts the halls of Crimson Peak. Meet Mario Bava, one of the great ghosts of cinema, and a dude with a mustache that would put Yosemite Sam to shame, son. His tale starts in 1941 with his birth in San Remo, Italy. Both a gifted cinematographer and director, Bava made 36 films in his time. Works of note include Black Sunday, Kill Baby Kill, and Blood and Black Lace. Fun fact, Bava also made a film titled Black Sabbath, a name Ozzy Osbourne lifted for his iconic band. Ozzy's idea to piss on the Alamo, however, was all his own brilliant idea. But the master of the macabre was an auteur as much as any Kubrick or Wells, so his films have several reoccurring traits. The first and most noticeable was his use of color. He'd paint scenes like these in contrasting hues, pairing, for example, reds with blues or greens with magentas. Now, oftentimes, the reasoning behind Bava's use of color was symbolic. Sickly green tones represented corruption. Deep reds would underline scenes of violence or passion. Or passionate violence where a woman was getting her face boiled against something really hot. Which I guess is sexy. Most times, though, Baba used color as a narrative device. It was a signal to the audience that a supernatural event was about to occur. So when the monsters were away, lighting was, you know, by the numbers. But when the spirit stirred, so did the color. And death never looked better. That beauty would not have been possible without a little help, which brings us to the second trademark of Baba's films, the use of sets. Baba used sets because, frankly, they're easier to light. You can hide a lot of 2Ks above a room without a ceiling, after all. And if you didn't notice, Baba cared quite a bit about lighting. So sets gave him the flexibility his style required. Plus you build a set, which allows the crew to increase the scale of the walls or warp the architecture like Bava did here and a hundred other times. The result, a world where everything seems just a bit off. Where the lighting can be manipulated to maddening effect, where proportion and scale defy reason, and one where Bava could make his surreal vision a reality. Now, speaking of realities, Baba's films share a common one. They're often period pieces where kings and commoners alike are haunted by transgressions of the past. And when I say haunted, well, I actually mean haunted. Take Black Sunday, for example. It takes place in 17th century Moldavia. The plot, a witch put to death returns 200 years later to kill her descendants. Kill Baby Kill fits the mold too. Fade in on 18th century Carpathia. The spirit of a murdered girl takes vengeance on a village at the behest of her grieving mother. Ah! Or I Vertilac, part of the Black Sabbath anthology. It's set in 19th century Russia, and the story revolves around a father who returns home 10 days after hunting a Vertilac, a creature that preys on the blood of its loved ones. And as you can guess, dad returns a Vertilac himself which makes for one hell of a family reunion. But let's talk big picture now. Now, as we've seen, Baba's films feature three distinct qualities. First, they showcase contrasting color palettes. Second, they're frequently shot on sets. Third, they're often period pieces, ones concerning dark pasts that overshadow the present day. But Mario Baba's dead. 
And by the 1980s, Italian horror was too. So what's this all got to do with Crimson Peak? Well, it turns out Guillermo del Toro's one hell of a medium because he's channeled every one of the aforementioned qualities into Crimson Peak. Don't believe me? Well, just look at these images again. Red and blue, two colors that when paired together, say it with me, create a distinct contrast, as do the greens and yellows right here. Black Manor surrounded by white snow falls into the same mode of thought, one we've seen time and time again in Bava's films. Next, look at the Sharp family mansion itself. The interiors aren't just sets, they're sets where every single shred of decorum was custom made for the film, built so both the lighting and production design were under Del Toro's complete control. Sound familiar, anyone? Well, so does the plot. Clearly, the Sharp family's got some skeletons in their closets. Literally. And the ghosts of their ancestral past are more than just whispered stories, they're actual phantoms that stalk the halls of Crimson Peak ones that menace its present day inhabitants. But those apparitions aren't alone, because behind every vivid color, every surreal set, and every tragic revelation is the spirit of Mario Bava, conjured by Guillermo del Toro in this startling tribute to classic horror. What is it? What do you want? And to think some people say ghost stories aren't true shows what they know. Thank you for watching, ladies and gentlemen, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel, Film Theory, for more fantastic film related content. And if you want to check out more frame by frame, make sure to click the frame to the left to watch my episode on the secret behind Birdman's continuous takes. Or, if you'd like to check out a Film Theory episode on Fifty Shades of Grey, click the frame to the right. And until next time, my name is Kyle, and this has been Frame by Frame.